Hello and welcome to the Actual Tech Media EcoCast. My name is Jess and I am excited to be here with you all today. But before we jump into our content, I have some basic information that I wanna cover with you. All right, let's kick off our day here today by taking a quick tour of your audience console. And we're going to start with the questions window. So if you haven't already said hi, there is a whole audience of cool humans out there. So reach out and give a wave to the other members of the actual tech media community. Now, keep in mind that if you do have any technical issues today, a browser refresh is going to fix just about anything. But if those tech gremlins are clinging on today, no problem. Just throw a comment in the question section and our crew will be there to help. We also want this to be an informative webinar for you. So throughout today's EcoCast, we hope you'll get engaged and ask all your burning questions. Not only will we have team members responding to you over a live chat, we will also have a dedicated Q&A session at the end of our presentations. Now, if we don't get to your question during the live webinar today, don't worry because the awesome experts that we have here with us will be following up after we wrap. All right, next up, there's going to be lots of cool aha moments on the EcoCast today. And if you want to share those with your community, we've made it nice and easy for you. You can use the Twitter button right there on your audience console and the hashtag for today's EcoCast will be automatically added to your post. All right, our last stop on this guided tour, be sure to check out the handouts tab for some awesome resources and takeaways from our speakers here today. We have an info pack collection, solution briefs, white papers, data sheets, free trials, eBooks, upcoming webinars, and more. So many great resources, so be sure to go explore. Now, if that wasn't enough fun, we also have some exciting prizes that we'll be giving away throughout today's EcoCast. I'm gonna tell you a bit more about those later on, but a few quick reminders for you all. First, you do need to be here live in attendance at the EcoCast in order to qualify to win a prize. And we will follow up with all of you after we wrap. Now, all winners must submit an IRS form W9 to Actual Tech Media, and all winners must meet the Actual Tech Media prize terms and conditions. Now, if you don't know what those full T's and C's are, that's fine. We've got the full thing for you. Just head on over to that handouts tab, click in, scroll down to the bottom, and you'll find them waiting for you there. Now, the absolute most important thing to remember is that we love getting all your insightful questions during these live webinars. In fact, we love it so much that we actually have a special additional prize for all you inquisitive folks out there. So in today's EcoCast, we will be giving away a prize for the best question asked in each of our live sessions. Now, the expert speakers and teams will review all questions asked after we wrap the webinar, which means that even if your question does not get read out in a live session, there is still a chance to win. If you are a lucky winner here today and you would like to donate the value of your prize, we have several wonderful organizations that we partner with. So let us know when we follow up about your big win and we'll get that rolling for you. Again, we are so happy to have you all here with us live at the EcoCast today, and we want to keep that good feeling going, so let's connect on social media. Reach out and connect with Actual Tech Media on Twitter and on LinkedIn. We have lots of great content, and we always want to hear from you. Now, if you're looking for more awesome content and resources right after we wrap the EcoCast today, be sure to subscribe to the Actual Tech Media channel on YouTube. Another fun way to win a prize and hey, grow this awesome community is to refer an industry friend or a coworker to the Actual Tech Media webinar series. Now you'll find a link to do that right in your handouts tab and you will also be automatically redirected at the end of the webinar. And both you and your coworker or friend could win a prize and we hold those drawings every month. So be sure to refer a friend because it, hey, it could quite literally be a win-win situation. Next, we have a cool opportunity for all the decision makers out there to get connected with new and emerging tech and innovative vendors. Here's how it works. All you need to do is click on the link in your handouts tab, fill out a quick application, and the actual tech crew will then match you with some vendors that we think you should probably be chatting with based on your needs. There will also be fun opportunities that you get to choose to join in, like surveys, test runs, uh, new solutions, extended demos, and so on. You'll get some chances to win extra prizes, you'll chat with great people, and you'll learn about the hottest new trends in tech. So be sure to apply, or hey, send that link to a decision maker on your team. Now I wanna take a quick minute here to remind you all about one of my favorite resources and that is ransomware.org. You can find out everything you need to know about ransomware, how to prepare, prevent, and recover. This site is jam packed with information, helpful tips, checklists, strategic approaches, case studies, everything you need in one place. So wherever you are in your ransomware preparedness journey, there is something for you at ransomware.org. Go check it out and start exploring. 
All right, I have one more exciting resource I have to tell you about today, and that is the Gorilla Guide Book Club. It's going to give you access to free enterprise IT books authored by top industry experts. So you can stay up to date on trending enterprise technology. And yes, these books will work on your Kindle, your mobile device, and as I said, they are completely free. You can download these awesome resources at gorilla.guide, and there's a link for you in that handouts tab as well. All right, well, we have covered a lot of important things already, and I don't know about you all, but I am excited to dive in. So let's get going. All right, folks, well, it is time to jump into the good stuff because here today we are chatting about turning your log and incident data into real-time security insights. I love that. I am very much looking forward to this conversation today, not just because I get to hang out with all of you, and it has been a minute since I've got to chat with you all on an Ecocast. Hello, my friends. I hope you're having great days, and thank you so much for joining us today. We have a lot of good stuff coming our way because we are obviously all all dealing with, we're aware of the fact at, that things are moving quickly. So this real time piece is a really important aspect of what we're getting into. And transforming log and incident data into actionable security insights is absolutely essential. So today, with the help of some top industry experts from Rubrik and from Sentinel One, we are going to explore these cutting edge strategies for real time data analysis and identify how you can use automations to quickly and accurately, love that, interpret log and incident data. So we've got some best practices. We're going to get into the tools and tips. We're going to help you implement some new techniques for that fast in the moment data analysis, that threat detection, all important there. And this discussion today is going to take some of those important steps from the strategy side of things into the action side of things so that you can strengthen your organization's security defenses. We have a lot of great stuff coming your way. I know you're itching to get into it. So let's get started here. Once again, my name is Jess Steinbach. I am a moderator here at Actual Tech Media and my friends and fellow moderators, Scott Becker, Mackenzie Puttesey and Keith Ward are here with us today on live chat. Uh, we have one more cool thing to cover before I introduce our keynote speaker, and I know you're all excited to get into that session, but that is prizes. So of course, today on the Ecocast, you could win one of three $300 Amazon gift cards that we will be giving away to three lucky winners who are here live and present with us at the Ecocast. And so we've got for you, uh, I stay tuned for this because the, the prizes are going to be coming hot and heavy with every 30 minutes, really. There, there's, there's quite a few chances to win. Now you do need to be here live in presence, as I said, and you do need to meet the actual tech media prize terms and conditions. If you're not sure what those T's and C's are, I mentioned this earlier, they are waiting for you in the handouts tab. So you can head on over to the handouts tab, click and scroll down and you will find the full T's and C's waiting for you there. All right, well, I said we were gonna get into our keynote and it is about time. I'm very excited to introduce our speaker who's gonna kick us off today. And I know some of you have gotten to hear Ward speak before. We always get some great content from you, Ward. Uh, this is Ward Spangerberg, founder, principal consultant at Alt Green Research LLC. Ward, so happy to have you back here with us on the keynote. I know you've got a lot planned, so I'm gonna step back and hand things on over to you. Take it away. Good morning, good afternoon and evening to everyone joining us today. Thank you for taking the time. My name is Ward Spangerberg, and today I'm going to discuss something become increasingly vital in our organizations. We're looking at log and incident data and how we can use that for real-time security insights. Over the next few minutes, we'll discuss how harnessing the power of your organization's existing data can move your security posture from less reactive to more proactive. We'll dive into a couple of examples and we'll talk about a case study that highlights how we use these benefits and the approach. Every device, application, network connection within your organization generates detailed records of events and activities. Similarly, incident data captures information about these past security events, breaches, or anomalies. Together, these data sets are akin to an untapped gold mine for enhancing your cybersecurity defense. Yet many organizations let this data go underutilized. Logs often end up stored, forgotten, only dusted off during audits or after security incidents. This reactive stance leaves us vulnerable to threats that could have been detected or even prevented with proactive analysis. Or worse, because of that overwhelming volume, you simply turn them off and hide your head, hoping you'll never need them again. 
Before we can unlock the potential of this data, we must acknowledge the obstacles that stand in our way. There's the volume and complexity. Modern IT environments generate massive amounts of data. The sheer volume can be crushing, making it impractical to sift through these logs manually. We have data silos. Logs are frequently scattered across various systems and applications and departments. This fragmentation makes it difficult to attain a holistic view of what's happening within the infra infrastructure. And then the lack of real-time analysis. There are the methods for re-retrospective analysis. We don't have those, and they may already be gone in some cases, the logs that are necessary. So how do we turn those challenges into opportunities for our strength? Here are four strategies you can use. Implement a centralized log management system. Establish that system to aggregate logs from all your sources. This approach breaks down the silos and provides a unified view of your environment, enabling a more efficient monitoring and analysis. Look at data normalization and enrichment. By standardizing the formats and enriching the data with contextual information, it makes it easier to analyze and correlate the events across different systems. It also enhances the quality. Start looking at real-time analysis. Utilize analytics that process that data on the fly, detect anomalies, real-life alerts, to let your security team know to respond quickly and efficiently. Leverage machine learning and artificial intelligence. These algorithms help in identifying patterns and anomalies that might be missed by traditional analysis. AI can even be used to help predict potential future security events. So let's talk about some real world examples of organizations that have effectively turned this around for themselves. We can look at proactive threat detection in finance. A finance company used was facing frequent attempts at unauthorized access. By integrating the log analysis and security, they can monitor access logs and detect unusual login patterns that indicated brute force attacks, immediately taking action against those offending IP address, blocking it, and preventing potential breaches. Another example, looking at the compliance in the healthcare industry. By utilizing AI and log analysis, they were able to centralize their log data where they could then do real-time analysis of everybody who was accessing patient records. Any unauthorized attempts were immediately flagged, enhancing the security and simplifying compliance reporting. Insider threat mitigation. IT company was concerned about the risk insider threats. They used machine learning to analyze employees' activities and identify users who were moving large amounts of sensitive data outside of the normal working hours. They could then investigate and uncover, uncover intentions to exfil that data. Early detection prevents a significant security incident. So let's dive into a case study. So TechCore, protect the name, protect the innocent here. They, a multinational technology firm that revolutionized its security operations by effectively utilizing log and incident data. The background here. TechCore was, was grappling with the several security challenges. They had frequent uh, phishing attacks against their employees who were regularly targeted because they are a leading financial firm. They had to let thre delay threat detection because security incidents are often detected days after they occurred. And then they had compliance issues because data was scattered throughout the organization and needing to meet regulatory requirements required lots of work. So they decided to overhaul their approach. They implemented the following strategies. They centralized their logging system. They deployed Elastic, an open source solution to aggregate logs from all the servers, applications, and network devices. This centralization provided a unified view of their entire environment in real time. They then looked at real-time analytics with ML. They were able to integrate continuous analysis. This enables systems to detect anomalies such as unusual network traffic patterns or even unauthorized access attempts. Then they, on top of that, they added automated incident response. They configured automated responses for certain triggers. If the system detected a potential breach, the affected user accounts were locked and the security team was alerted immediately for response. The results, this is what was amazing. They reduced their detection time. The time taken to detect a security incident decreased from an average of three days to under 10 minutes. 
They were able to improve their compliance by having centralized logs and automated analysis and alerting. They were able to hit all of their compliance requirements across various regulations. And then they saved an estimated 40% from the reduction of actual security incidents. So the conclusion here, by transforming their security operations from being reactive to being truly proactive, by leveraging these new log incident and analysis effectively, they reduced their risk and had some cost savings across the board. So based on these examples and their experience, here's some of the best practices for you to consider. Invest in the right tools, select scalable and flexible solutions that fit your organization's needs. Open source tools offer customization while commercial solutions provide robust ready to use features. Integrate machine learning. Machine learning can detect compromises and complex patterns and anomalies that a human analyst will often miss, especially identifying persistent threats. Ensure your data quality. Make sure that you have everything that is accurate, timely, and properly formatted. Build a scaled team. Equip your security team with the necessary skills to interpret data, respond effectively. Continuous training and development are essential. Finally, establish clear policies and procedures. Define data collection processes, control and responses. Clear guidelines ensure consistency and help maintain those compliance with regulations. In today's threat landscape, relying on a retrospective analysis is no longer a sufficient. Cyber threats are evolving rapidly and attackers are becoming sophisticated. Real-time security insults derived from this log and incident data enable organizations to anticipate and stop anything that causes significant problems. So imagine this, it's navigating a boat with a radar or you could just rely on what you knew and hope that nothing has changed. With real-time analysis, you're actually navigating with information as you're going down the river. Make sure that you're collecting the data from all your relevant sources. Do you have centralized systems for log management? Are we utilizing real-time analytics and machine learning? Is our security team equipped to act on the insights we're generating? Identify gaps is the first step towards strengthening your security posture. To wrap this up, let's revisit the key takeaways here. Data is powerful. Your log and incident data hold the keys to unlocking real-time security insights, proactive over reactive. Moving from a reactive to a proactive security approach signifies, reduces any potential losses. Continuous improvement. Cybersecurity is not a one-time effort, but ongoing process that requires regular evaluation and adaptation. By effectively turning your log and incident data into real-time insights, your position, your organization is better defended against current and future threats. Thank you for your time and attention. I hope this discussion has provided some valuable insights into how you can leverage your existing data to enhance your cybersecurity efforts. I'm happy to answer any questions or delve deeper into any of the topics I've covered today. You can drop me a line at wardspan at Research. Thank you. And now back to your host. <laughs> Ward, okay, before I get into thanking you for some wonderful content, I do have to say I can totally relate. I can feel your brain sort of glitching a little bit there. And I am having the same problem today that happened to me when I was talking about prizes with you all just a second ago. I don't know what is going on. There are my my colleague and I who are she's behind the scenes helping make sure everything stays on the track. We were talking about the tech gremlins in the system today. They are they are really in the system and they are also in my brain today. It is, I don't know if anyone else is feeling like you're having a Monday, a Monday day of a Thursday, but I am feeling like I'm having a Monday of a Thursday. So thank you all for being with us and bearing through. Clearly Ward has a few gremlins in the system as well. Uh, Ward, thank you so much for that though. A really, really great content and appreciate you kicking us off with some best practices because of course now we're going to get into some of those actual action steps and solutions that we've got ahead. 
And it's so important to start with that sort of understanding of why, why we're having these conversations today, why it's so important to get into making some of these changes and implementing some of this, uh, these tools in our organizations. Now, on that note, we do have a question up on the screen for all of you. We are wondering what your time frame is. Are you, are you thinking that you have an urgent need here? You know, you're listening to Ward and you're thinking, ooh, we are not doing any of those best practices. We better make a change pretty quickly. Or are, you know, are you kind of, things are going fine and things are working, but you think there's room for improvement and maybe that's a little bit of a longer term solution. So whatever your time frame is, there's, there's no wrong answer here. This just helps us make sure that we're hitting you with the right information when you need it. So let us know where you're at in that process. Uh, and I'm gonna give that just another second longer and then I'm gonna move things right along because I don't know about you folks, but I am ready to get into these solutions. I'm ready to start exploring what we can actually do to help take some action in our organizations. So let's kick things off. And as you can see, we are definitely starting the EcoCast out today with a bang. We have the one and only Rubric crew here with us to kick things off. So today we will be hearing from Zoltan Diak, Director of Product Marketing at Rubrik. Zoltan, thank you so much for being here to get us started on the EcoCast today. I know you have a lot of great stuff planned for our audience. So I am going to hand things over and uh, take it away, Zoltan. Hello, everyone. Welcome. My name is Zoltan Diak, and I work on our security capabilities here at Rubrik. And today I'm here to talk about how you can turn your IT data into security insights. So what exactly does that mean? Uh, well, most people would talk about it as taking data and signal from different systems in your IT and security environment and correlating those signals to detect and prevent threats. That's pretty bread and butter stuff for a security team, right? But most organizations are missing signal and intelligence from a crucial part of their IT infrastructure that can help them not only do a better job detecting threats, but become more cyber resilient. So not just preventing threats, but responding faster, minimizing the damage of successful attacks and recovering faster. And we're going to talk about that overlooked signal today. But before we do, let me take a quick step back with some context. Uh, at Rubrik, our mission is to secure the world's data. So everything we think about is through that lens. Uh, we think about data as the crown jewels of any organization today. And securing data is more important now than ever, of course, but that is incredibly challenging. Your data is growing faster than ever. It's growing across on-prem, cloud, and SaaS environments at record rates. Uh, requirements for transparency of sensitive data breaches is increasing too. And so are the fines behind them as governments are trying to push private industry to invest more in securing their customers' private data. And the number of attacks targeting data is increasing along with those things as adversaries very much understand your organization's data is the most valuable asset you have. So attackers very well understand that going after your data is going to be very financially rewarding for them. And so we've thrown a lot at this problem, haven't we? Um, I have a lot of conversations with customers about their data, specifically about protecting and securing that data. And the conversations almost always start off with preventing threats. How can I detect and prevent more threats faster across this ever expanding IT landscape <clears throat> with adversaries that are becoming more and more sophisticated and attacks that are coming at greater volumes than ever? And it's a really great conversation to have. We talk about different systems that organizations are implementing to secure their on-prem cloud or SaaS environments and different strategies and frameworks those companies are utilizing to prevent those threats. At some point, uh, those conversations always turn towards the types of signals these organizations are using to detect threats and how they're correlating those signals to figure out if an attack is happening, uh, what that attack looks like, and who's doing the attacking. 
Um, a typical enterprise organization tends to run somewhere between 50 to 75 different security tools with this in mind, right? So they're trying to cover off on everywhere they might be attacked. And I love looking at the kill chain as a framework for these types of discussions because it really helps us understand and break down different things around how defense in depth works. Um, how should it work, right? The idea behind defense in depth is let's break down a cyber attack into different phases and find a means to identify signal and use it to disrupt every single phase of these attacks, right? So great, um, across the kill chain today, we use all these different tools across reconnaissance, weaponization, uh, delivery, exploitation, installation, command and control. And I always ask the question, um, you know, which of these tools is about defending your data specifically? All of these tools are about detecting and preventing unauthorized access to your infrastructure. Um, but there's nothing that really gives you any sort of actionable intelligence for when your high value data is under attack. Um, if you're going to argue DLP, when was the last time your DLP told you what sensitive data or regulated data in your environment uh, was there and where is it located? Uh, there's nothing that has a sense of where that data is or who has access to it. Um, and when you look at the last stage, impact or, or action from objective, literally where the bad guys land, lay hands on your data, encrypt it, steal it, destroy it, whatever the case might be, there's virtually nothing in terms of capabilities you can use to prevent or disrupt that last stage. Uh, where's your signal when someone is threatening your sensitive data? And, you know, the fact of the matter is that the vast majority of successful attacks leverage compromised legitimate credentials in some way, shape, or form, right? Over 80% of cyber attacks use identity-based techniques. Um, virtually any cyber attack today involves stolen credentials, compromised identities, stolen access tokens, uh, API keys, whatever it might be, right? Um, either for the initial access or for lateral movement. So how do you actually stop something if you don't have any IOCs, any file hashes, any IPS signatures and so forth? <clears throat> um, so when attackers you know, get in, they're, they're bypassing all your layers of defense in depth to access your data, right? All those systems heavily focused on securing your infrastructure. Cloud infrastructure security, network security, endpoint security, and then what happens to your data? We see these capabilities getting bypassed day in and day out, right? They're just logging in after they compromise credentials. Um, and after they bypass your infrastructure security, they virtually have free access to data, the stuff that hurts us the most, the stuff we're really trying to protect. And we need to start thinking about data security from a data perspective. We need to start with data, understanding our data, because we can't defend it if we don't understand it. So with all that, how do we understand the data we're protecting? How do we pull signal from it and turn that signal into actionable insights? Um, in all my years working in cybersecurity, I have to admit, uh, I never really thought about backups. I knew they were there to fall back to in the event of an attack, but that's all I really thought of them as. Um, a very important insurance policy in case data was compromised. And maybe in the past, that's all they really were, but modern backup and recovery systems host a wealth of potential intelligence about your data that can help you protect it. Um, so Rubrik first made a name for itself, revolutionizing that enterprise data protection space. And we did a lot and we continue to do a lot to revolutionize that space. 
Um, one of the ways we did this was by bringing data and metadata together. What I mean by that is when we take a backup snapshot, we're actually scanning the data we're backing up so that we learn a whole lot of interesting things about that data. Uh, in other words, we have a whole lot of context about the data that we're protecting. And when our customers started coming to us and saying, hey, we love your backup and data protection, but the whole reason we back up our data is to be able to recover that data if something happens to it. And of course, one of the primary threats to data in today's world is cyber attacks. So we quickly realized, hey, there's a whole lot of value to that data context that can help our customers before, during, and after a cyber attack. So what is that context? We're able to tell you where your data is stored. May sound simple, right? But in today's world, data stored on-prem, multiple cloud environments, SaaS applications, and it's growing to a point where a typical, a typical organization is going to add you know, over 150 million sensitive data records in the next five years. So all of that's really, really hard to track. Um, what type of data is it? What's in it? Is it sensitive data, PII, regulated data? How's that data changing over time? Uh, who has access to that data and how is that access changing over time? Right, all that's really useful insight um, that we provide through our data protection capabilities. So it's actually insight and signal you should already have within your network that you may not be taking advantage of today. And it comes from a source that people don't really think about, your enterprise backup. So you can turn that signal into actionable intelligence and correlate it with your security tools. So let's talk about how to use that signal. So first of all, I wanna stop focusing just on prevention. When we think about data security, it's about managing risk and working towards cyber resilience because threats are going to get through your infrastructure security. Um, and at Rubrik, we think about what we can do again before, during, and after an attack to maintain resiliency that will help us the most when it comes to, to that data. So before an attack, there are things you can do to reduce your overall level of data exposure. That includes things like right-sizing, who has access to data. So implementing least privileged access. Removing redundant, obsolete, or trivial data. And of course, ensuring you're backing up everything that matters into an immutable backup. Uh, the less you have exposed, the less damaging if you're breached, right? Um, during an attack, it's all about being able to detect threats in your data that may have gotten past your perimeter. If something's gotten in, you may already have damage, but if you can detect them before they've managed to exfiltrate a large volume of data or move further laterally, you're minimizing the impact. And finally, after an attack, of course, you want to be able to recover as quickly and safely as possible. Uh, if we can do these three things well, we can lower our overall risk and increase our cyber resilience. Um, so this is going, um, going deeper and focusing on the data itself. So let's drill into each one of these things a bit. So let's start with, of course, before an attack happens. Um, I mentioned earlier, securing data is about managing risk. And risk starts with understanding that risk because of course you can't defend what you don't understand. So you have to do some really good discovery to understand what data you're responsible for because every asset of data that's in your environment, um, you are ultimately responsible for. And then you've got to get rid of all the stuff that doesn't serve the business purpose. So that's really the first step. Um, understand what you still use in your business process um, processes, right? That's, that's really the second step. 
if you have regulated data assets around that are like three, four, five years old, do you need them on a live system? Um, if the answer is no, archive it, uh, remove it from live systems because if it's sitting there, it's still introducing risk. Um, if it gets out, you still face regulatory fines. Uh, and that's what makes you pay a ransom, right? Um, step three, uh, make sure the right people have access to the data, but not everybody. Um, I know at first this may sound like, man, now you're talking about zero trust for data. Um, I firmly believe we'll never reach that nirvana state, um, but we can start simpler. Um, you know, it's not an all or nothing thing. Um, simple steps to use as a starting point. Um, so for example, if you're in the United States in California, uh, employee records fall under CCPA. Um, let's say um, you find yourself in a situation where the PII of your employees is accessible to everyone in the company. That's a ton of risk, right? But how many people work in HR? Maybe 3% of your employees? So let's just say you only reduce access to people in HR. Uh, that reduced the risk from a CCPA perspective to those PII records by 97%. Hey, that's significant. And it's pretty easy to do. It's a starting point. And of course, you always want to make sure you have an immutable backup for the data that truly matters. Um, I think it's about in 96% of ransomware attacks, we're seeing attackers go directly after the backups, right? They know this is your ultimate life insurance and they're specifically targeting it so you'll be forced to pay their ransom. Rubrics data discovery and classification capabilities can really help you reduce sensitive data exposure, manage exfiltration risk by discovering what type of sensitive data you have and where it lives, uh, we also have the ability to understand who has access to this data so you can more easily implement least privileged access. And we're providing this capability through our enterprise backup solution, which means we're doing this without introducing additional scanners on your network in a production environment. We're scanning backup snapshots, which also means we're able to track all of your sensitive data and access to that sensitive data over time, right? So all of this super powerful signal you can turn into actionable intelligence. All right, so let's move on to uh, what about during an attack? What happens if what I spoke about earlier comes true, right? Um, unfortunately, your infrastructure defenses have been bypassed and now you have malicious files in your network that are poised to attack your data. Um, at that point, you're, you've already been compromised, right? Um, so ransomware or other attacks may be laying dormant, uh, conducting reconnaissance, moving laterally, or even being, you know, beginning to encrypt uh, data. Um, having a last line of defense to scan for these activities is pretty critical. Again, with the focus on your data. Uh, we want to scan for IOCs, of course, but there are also indicators in your data itself. Is your sensitive, is your sensitive data being encrypted or duplicated? Is that data being downloaded? Um, is access to sensitive data expanding in an abnormal way? And we want to focus on the data that truly matters, right? That sensitive or regulated data that's going to cripple your business or threaten your customers or result in significant regulatory fines. So constantly monitoring for these things over time will help tip you off as to whether an attack is happening so you can respond faster to contain the threat and minimize potential damage. So Rubrik provides anomaly detection, threat monitoring, and threat hunting capabilities to help you accomplish all of these things really quickly and without putting additional load on your production environment. Um, threat monitoring is our proactive 
always on capability that scans your backups for threats. Um, it utilizes threat intelligence feeds from Rubrik Zero Labs, Google Mandiant, and other third-party sources to automatically scan your backups for the latest IOCs. So think of it as constant vigilance um, that you can set and forget. Um, threat hunting is our surgical tool. You can use it to scan for specific IOCs. Um, it's the fastest in the business with a proprietary architecture that allows us to scan thousands of backup images in seconds. Um, imagine your industry has been recently victimized by a specific threat and the board calls wanting to know if you've been impacted. So threat hunting gives you the power to search using hashes or Yara rules so you can determine if you're infected. Um, and if you are infected, you can determine um, when that um, infection occurred so you can recover as quickly and safely as possible without reinfecting the environment. So I'm getting ahead of myself. We're getting into now uh, what happens after an attack. So when it comes to recovering from a cyber attack, every second counts, right? The faster you can recover, the less your business is impacted. Good news is we generally know the things we need to accomplish to be able to recover. We need to understand what data was compromised. Uh, we need to know when that data was compromised so we can understand what a safe recovery point is. So rubrics tools allow you to quickly identify those things and identify and quarantine any malicious files so we can prevent reinfection when we restore. And of course, um, you know, we handle the orchestration uh, uh, of actually restoring clean data and systems. So Rubrik's data remediation capabilities are going to allow you then to surgically and rapidly recover your apps, your files, or your objects while avoiding malware reinfection. So you can safely, at any scale and granularity, quarantine infected data, restore impacted apps, files, or objects, and orchestrate recovery of applications. So this is, again, all made possible by the fact that we get this data context, this signal from your backup snapshots. So all this data context you already have in your enterprise backup can be turned into intelligence that helps you achieve greater cyber resilience. And on its own, it's really powerful, right? Like I just demonstrated three different phases where um, you know, this type of context can add significant value. But we also thought, well, what if we worked with other security vendors who don't have this type of insight this type of data context, this type of um, you know, uh, well, insight into the data that they're protecting. Um, if you think about a traditional cybersecurity vendor, they're generally very focused on prevention and they utilize threat intelligence, right? Whether we're talking about network security, cloud security, endpoint security, they generally have tremendous insight into threats so they can identify when an attack is happening and stop that attack. They have insight into you know, IOCs, TTPs, vulnerabilities, threat actor profiles, but they don't have any understanding of the data they're protecting. They can't because they don't have anything scanning the data itself. So we thought, what if we could combine Rubrik's data context with that type of threat intelligence? that would give a much more holistic view into an attack and the target of those attacks. So customers would be even better equipped to defend themselves. Let's take an example. Let's say a security event is logged into CrowdStrike XDR. And what we see is some unusual network traffic around a particular IP address or VM, right? On its own, that alert might be alarming, but might be missed or not given uh, a high priority by a SOC analyst because they're sorting through hundreds of other alerts in their queue. 
consider the same scenario, <clears throat> with, but we add rich rubric data context, all the context I just described, delivered directly into CrowdStrike XDR. Now the SOC analyst um, can quickly see that the target IP address contains sensitive data records that have been classified as high or medium risk. Maybe it's personally identifiable patient records. Um, data that would be particularly harmful if it's compromised and likely subject to regulatory fines, right? Suddenly this event takes on much more importance because we understand not only the threat, but the significance of the target of that threat. So this event is actually an incident that should be highly prioritized immediately, potentially isolating that compromised endpoint and shutting down traffic to and from the IP address. And then more detailed forensic analysis should be applied to determine if the data was accessed or compromised, and if so, when it occurred and how severe the impact was. At that point, it's all about streamlining remediation and recovery, right? So by combining our data context with threat intelligence, we can enable security analysts to more quickly prioritize attacks on their data by understanding if there is suspicious activity surrounding that sensitive data. So we're empowering them to be able to respond faster, um, preventing a threat or containing the damage. Um, defenders need that threat context from their security tools combined with data context. So signal and information on what is being targeted. They can't understand the true risk without understanding if an attack is targeting high value data and whether it was an isolated or targeted event. So without context, it's much harder to prioritize and take action against potential threats to data. And so we've delivered a series of integrations across SOAR, SIM, XDR, and other security tools to bring that data context directly into those tools. And CrowdStrike XDR, great example of this, right? So by combining rubric data context with threat intelligence, um, that really delivers these actionable insights into threats and the target of those threats in one place to help security personnel respond more quickly to those high priority attacks and ultimately achieve greater cyber resiliency. So these capabilities are, are all critical components of any modern defense in depth kind of strategy today, right? We know with the growth of enterprise data and how valuable it is, um, it's the primary target of attackers. We know attackers are going to get through. So we need to be able to ensure that we're as resilient as possible in the face of successful attacks on data. Um, and rubric really gives you additional value through what you already have in your enterprise backups. We give you that additional signal that no one else can give you, insight and actionable intelligence to help you defend what attackers are targeting, your high value data. And we extend that signal into your security tools so you can correlate it with your threat intelligence in one location. Um, all this is available th uh, through our natively built tools in the Rubrik Security Cloud um, without the need to deploy and manage agents in a production environment. Rubrik is there for the entire data lifecycle, right? From the time data is stored and backed up to the time it could be potentially breached. Um, Rubrik's really the only platform that offers cyber recovery and cyber posture we're enabling cyber resilience under one umbrella without the need for third parties. All right, so uh, that's all my time for today. Uh, thank you for taking the time to listen. I hope you um, got some value out of it. Um, and if you have any questions or want to learn more, join us at rubric.com.
Thank you. Have a great day. Oh, Zoltan, thank you so much. What a great presentation. I was thinking, you know, it turns out the the cure for a, a Monday kind of Thursday is is you, Zoltan. What, what a great presentation. What a great way to start out the EcoCast. I am feeling fired up on all cylinders now. I think we all learned a ton and I can see that there's still some questions coming in. I do want to say uh, Zoltan and I chatted about all the information that we needed to cover and we felt that we were going to probably hit the end of our time, which we have. So what we're going to do is take all the questions that you've asked and we're going to make sure that those get sent to the rubric team. So you will get responses back to all the questions that you're asking. We will make sure that you hear back from Rubric. We'll do our best to answer on live chat today, but the rest will come through to you in email. So keep those questions coming in. Now, another great way to make sure that you're getting the information that you want from Rubric is actually just to click on your screen right now. We've got a whole bunch of options here. There's some data sheets. Maybe you want to get into pricing. Maybe you want that personalized demo. You want to kind of get into the sandbox yourself. Whatever it is that you're looking for, whatever additional information you'd like to receive from Rubric, you can click on your screen right now and the team will follow up with you and get that conversation started. Now, another great way to learn a little bit more right away is to go visit the handouts tab. You can click into the rubric link, find that it's from actually rubric zero labs. It's called the state of data security, measuring your data's risk. I absolutely love this read. I know that I shouldn't be so focused on design, but come on, the design in here is so easy to read. It's so easy to follow. It breaks everything apart into kind of key points and, and walking you through, you know, risks and then, you know, what, what are the KPIs and the ROIs and what's the argument you can bring to your team members about why this is the right solution for you. It's just great. It's got quotes. I love it. Uh, so head on over uh, and make sure you've got that handout. Spend some time exploring that. Uh, again, the Rubric Zero Labs report on kind of taking a look, zooming in a little bit more on measuring your data's risk. Uh, all right, so while you're clicking on the screen, while you're downloading that handout, I am going to give away our very first $300 Amazon gift card. And that is going to go to someone who is here live and present at the EcoCast. And that lucky someone is Chinwei Lin from Washington. Chinwei Win from Washington, congratulations. Now, as always, we will be in touch about claiming your prize after we wrap up the EcoCast. So stay tuned for that. And don't forget there are still two more chances to win an Amazon gift card today. Plus we do have that best question gift card from each of our sessions. So even if we don't get to your question in a live Q&A session, you are still entered to win just by asking. Well, speaking of our wonderful sessions, I think it's time that we move things right along because we have come to our second, and I'm sorry to say this final presentation of the EcoCast. I wish we had more time together today, but don't worry folks, because not only are we not finished yet, we are definitely ramping things up with a dynamic duo from the Sentinel One, and that is Kyle Pollack, Senior Strategic Solution Engineer, and Mike McGrill, Senior Engineering Manager, both from Sentinel One. Kyle and Mike, thank you so much for being here with us on the EcoCast today. You're wrapping us up in style. I can't wait to hear what you have in store for us. So I'm going to hand things on over to you. Take it away, team. All right. We're a couple minutes in, so we will go ahead and get started. Just want to say thanks again, everyone, for joining us. Appreciate you taking time out of your day to join our webinar. And today, uh, we're very excited to introduce Sentinel-1's Singularity AI Sim. Uh, this is a, a new launch for us that came uh, during a Black Hat, super exciting product launch for Sentinel-1. Uh, so we're going to walk through the new goods that are part of this, um, some expansion of some existing product and some new functionality, uh, and then also some juicy integrations with existing platforms uh, that we've seen uh, out in the field. Uh, so by way of an agenda, of course, we'll introduce ourselves. I'm joined by a phenomenal colleague of mine. Um, we're going to talk about things that are just inherently not really working that we've seen as practitioners ourselves and also throughout our customer base. Uh, we'll talk about Sentinel-1's approach to improvements in this arena. And we've got some really juicy details on transforming and transitioning data lakes, sims, all that good stuff. By way of introductions, uh, my name is Mike McGrail. I'm in Toronto, Canada, and I lead our solutions engineering team uh, globally uh, for our Singularity Data Lake and AI Sim for Sentinel-1. I've been here for about two years. Mr. Pollack, over to you, sir, so you can introduce yourself. Thank you very much. My name is Kyle Pollack. I am a solutions architect working on Mike's team. Really excited to uh, talk about some of the awesome things we've got coming with this 
this new product and some of the advances we're offering. Yeah, thank you, sir. Appreciate you. I probably should have added a tagline underneath there that says I am also Kyle's number one fan. So really uh, super excited to be here with you, Kyle. Really like doing this stuff with you. The feeling is mutual. <laughs> Thanks, man. So getting right into the contents, uh, we just want to look at cybersecurity. We're here to talk about data lakes, AI sims. You know, these are not inherently new things. You know, sims have been around for quite some time now, you know, decades. Uh, but there's really been some significant problems uh, that have, I would say, hindered them, prevented them from really meeting the promise. I don't think I'm dispelling too much. If we internally, if I just talk about the fact that internally it's something one we deliberated on, you know, whether we even wanted to use the term SIM, we purposely and intentionally waited to use the term SIM for our platform for some time, uh, just because it's almost like the term SIM carries some baggage uh, due to these failures over the past several decades. Uh, first and foremost is just increases in data volumes. Um, we know that obviously uh, there's so many stats out there when you look at the volumes of data that are being generated. We blew way past terabytes, we're into zettabytes. Um, it's just absolutely massive volumes of data that are being generated and it's exponential growth. And the traditional logging platforms that were built decades ago for on-premise data centers we're just never meant for the volumes that we see today in clouds. And they've been really hindered on the ability to query across large volumes of data, really tied to small index-based uh, hunting and investigating, just unable to keep up with growing data volumes. In tandem with that, cost concerns are rampant. Uh, Kyle, I don't want to speak for half of you, but I, I feel like every customer that we talk to, the very first number one thing that comes up is cost. Uh, logging platforms to simply hold logs and enable security practitioners to hunt and query against them. And then do they all, all the operational things we need, like alerts, build out dashboards and visualizations and proactive detections. We just, we just can't do it. It's way too expensive to feed the data in that we need for our security stands. So it just, it really doesn't make sense. First of all, can't keep up with the volume and it's also too expensive. The other thing that we run into is too many tools. Uh, so we have data sprawl all over the place. And a lot of times what we see is security practitioners and IT and DevOps and even business analysts and other teams need the same data. I think of things like Active Directory logs, um, firewall logs, you know, you name it. Uh, two different teams need that data to draw different insights, the security posture or uptime resiliency availability. It's the same data. But we're having to bifurcate and send that data to two different platforms just to service use cases. And we talk in tandem with the inability to scale and the cost, it effectively doubles. It just, it really doesn't make sense. Uh, and then the last one is uh, compliance needs. So we need to hold this data, um, more of it. We need to make it faster and we need to hold it longer. And that's just simply something that other companies and other tools and platforms just haven't been able to do. And I'm super excited about what Sentinel One has launched because um, it meets all three of these. So in summation, to stitch it all together, Considering the architecture, considering the open source schema, considering cloud native, really what that distills down into is that Singularity's AI SIM is, it's really is the industry's fastest AI powered SIM, but it's for all data and all workflows. That's from integrations that Kyle's going to walk us through in just a minute, all the way through hunt and investigation of the data to alerts and then downstream automation actions. Kyle, hopefully that's a good tee up, sir. Are you prepared to share your screen and run through a quick demo on our? AI platform. Uh, and indeed, let me go ahead and do that. Amazing, thank you, sir. All right, you should be seeing the catalog now. Let me know if I messed it up. <clears throat> so, from Mike Sandoff, right? one of the most important things that we really can talk about because it is a data problem is how do we get data into Sentinel One? Now, first of all, fundamentally, as Mike remarked already. Our platform is already a EDR platform, a cloud workload protection platform. And so all of the data for the different first party Sentinel-1 tools are already logged directly into this data lake. What we need to concern ourselves with is how do we, how do we get everything else here and make it a part of this system? The most common way that customers choose to do this is by using the singularity marketplace of integrations. You can see I've got a catalog here. These integrations have different functions, different things that they can do. The most common one being log ingestion, going out and retrieving logs from them. Uh, but, you know, when we talk about XDR, when we talk about the future of SIM, it's not just about getting data in, it's also about being able to do something with it. And you'll see that there are also integrations that allow for 
automations or response actions to be taken. So going out to something like Okta and being able to reset a user's password if based on what we see in the same side of the house, that is something we think we need to do. I can pick up any one of these individually and we'll have a relatively simple walkthrough for something like Azure AD, where I want to go ahead and install this integration. I, of course, am going to need to have the tenant ID, application, client secret, and just say, great, now I'm ready to start doing this ingestion. Now, once we've got data flowing in, how do you actually interact with all these logs, both the first party Sentinel-1 stuff and anything else you've chosen to bring to us? Well, within the overall Sentinel-1 dashboard, you've got a bunch of options down the left-hand side. We're going to jump into the event search. And there's a couple of different things uh, that I'm going to show off here. So one, right, I talked already about all this first party data that we have, and Mike remarked on it as well. To give you an idea of what this realistically means, what is the power of having all of that uh, at Sentinel-1 already? Right now, I've just gone into the data lake. I've run a query looking for, hey, what are all the logs that the data source name is Sentinel-1? And in this, I've got this event type field that encapsulates many of the different event types that we capture. And in the last 24 hours, I've run this query, and you can see where are we logging? Process creations, module loads, IP connections, uh, file edit, renames, etc. DNS resolutions. To me, the really important thing about this is, historically, if I wanted to get this type of data and use it in any other SIM platform, the level of effort to do that and the cost to do that would be very high. I would either have to turn on a telemetry stream like this out of an EDR product and send it, you can see for just my handful of endpoints that I've got in this demo environment, that's already 12 million logs in 24 hours. Yeah, that's going to blow up your license really quick. Or I would have to go get DNS logs from my DNS server, go get Windows event logs from every single endpoint, uh, go get DHCP logs. And there are definitely situations in which you should still get that, but we have a great amount of data for you to get started with. Now, what can I do with all this awesome data? Well, here's a quick example. If I wanted to look for lateral movement on my network, right? historically how I might do that would be looking for someone trying to SSH or RDP to different devices. And again, I'd have to go get a ton of firewall logs, and you should definitely get your edge firewall logs, but maybe you don't have something that can do a great job of blogging east-west traffic. Maybe you don't have a firewall doing all that segmentation. I've already got all this data from the EDR side of the house. So I can come in and say, hey, you know, in the last 24 hours, go get every network connection event. I only care if it's going to a private IP address. I only care if it's going to one of these common road access ports. And then I want to know what endpoints are doing this the most in my environment. So as you can see, I can quickly answer a lot of these questions. The last point that I want to make is this one. Uh, Mike talked about OCSF, right? and the fact that we try and make things very easy for you in order to do searches, in order to understand your data across many different vendors. So I've got this incredibly basic search, src underscore endpoint.ip equals star. This field name is the universally agreed upon field name for a source IP address in the OCSF schema, as Mike said, open, controlled by the community, not by Sentinel-1. We build parsing, you build ingestion for these different data sources. And so I've done nothing other than enable the ingestion for these things. And you can see that this one field, this one query, pulls back data for me across all of these different network and login related data sources. I think that's super valuable because when you wanna go search for something, you don't have to intimately know the schema of these different data sources. And you don't have to spend time on trying to normalize them. It just works. And the last thing that I think is really amazing is just, frankly, the performance of this thing. If I come in and I say, you know what, I'm really interested in just searching for an IP address or something, I can do something like this and just say, hey, free text search the raw message field of every single log in the last 24 hours. Or if I want to be more aggressive, I can do something crazy like, hey, search the raw message field, but also search every single field through this string. Brute force every single log I've seen in the last 24 hours across every data source, and I can actually get an answer 
in seconds. Any other system I've personally used before, unless I spent a bajillion dollars on deploying a bunch of CPU for it, this would have broken it. Now, that's all awesome. How do we make this usable? How do we make this you know, reduce the barrier of entry for you as a user? There's two things that we do for you. One, we've only talked about this a little bit, is a tool called Purple AI, a company has been working on for quite some time. There's a bunch of use cases for Purple AI. I'm not going to get on the rabbit hole all of them. But one of the most important ones is being able to come in here and ask plain English questions of this AI tool, have it answer your questions, and for our use case, enabling it to write queries for you to get you a long way along the path of doing any kind of investigation, alert creation, dashboard, etc. So I read a news article, I'm interested in Rio ransomware. I come in and I say, hey, I want to know about Ryuk. I get some details, I can get some IOCs, and then I can do something like, hey, can you uh, find indicators of compromise for Ryuk? Now, if I was doing this myself, where would I really run into a problem? That's a lot of DNS domains names, that's a lot of IP addresses. Writing this query, yeah, I could do it, but I'd probably mess it up 12 times before I did it right, and that's not a Sentinel-1 problem, that is, any sim in the world problem. Or I can take a lot of the grunt work off of my back, have it go through and pull all the MD5 hashes, all the SHA hashes, all the different versions, all the DNS domains, et cetera, and build this really big query for me. And guess what? Pull back the results. The last thing that I wanna talk about is, yeah, we've been in the business of being an EDR company for a long time. So we have a massive, massive library of detections built around the EDR product. One of the things that I'm really excited about with the AI sim is that we are increasingly publishing a library of detections for third party solutions. So if you bring things like CloudTrail logs, Okta, Azure AD, et cetera, to us, these are things that we are gonna be able to run detections on, find new threats for you. And if you've got something that you wanna build for yourself, we have templates and examples that you can open take these queries, we're not gonna obfuscate it from you, and you can use it to go build a better security program for yourself without having to reinvent the wheel. Back to you, Mike. Wow, so hey, when you ran that search, those 12 million records, were you specifying an index that you were searching across? No, there, there are no indexes. There's none of that. I essentially asked the solution to brute force every single log it has seen in the last 24 hours, whether that is a first party Sentinel-1 EDR log, of which there are many, a third party log, a meta log about how the system operates, doesn't matter, free text search every single field and the raw message field, and I got an answer in seconds. So I can be cheeky and say, if there's no indexes, that means that you don't have to do uh, distilling data down to the summary indexes so you can try to search them? We nailed it. The performance is, is that good that none of those usual workarounds are necessary. Amazing. We can actually use a log analytics platform for log analytics. <laughs> Incredible. Thank you for that, Kyle. That was an awesome demo, man. Every I swear, you're so polished at this point. I think the challenge with the webinar is that, and I'm just saying, you know, for Mike, like you're not able to tangibly see just how fast the performance that is. Because you're clicking through and it's running, and I see 12 million records. It took like a second. Um, you know, I mean, I've been in the world where you wait for a minute or several minutes, or iterate, like you mentioned, iterating over searches and waiting for them to complete, and then oh, I got to go change it or fix it or something like that. And it's just so snappy and performant. Um, I, you know, as we wrap up toward the end, we get to Q and A in a few minutes. I just I encourage everyone to really kick the tires on this because it just you don't really get the feel until you touch it, see it, feel it. Like just the, the webinar is not really doing it justice. Um, yeah, thanks again, Kyle. So as we pivot over, uh, you talked about transitioning, right? And and how do we make lives easier? And the Purple AI, the natural language is just absolutely phenomenal. It's been a huge response uh, from customer base and, and from folks coming up to us at different uh, booths and stuff like that, events. But I think of, you know, my previous life or, you know, different colleagues, like we have tools that are deployed already. And it's not just always about the tooling, right? People process technology as a thing. And it takes a lot of work to make any sort of shift. And clearly Sentinel One is here to transform this sim industry, right? We're on the front lines of fundamentally changing 
the way, breaking down these barriers of using more data held longer, making it faster. So no question, generative AI, putting it to use, uh, first to market, by the way. So again, props to Sentinel-1 for, for really leading the charge here. Um, at times, it, it really doesn't feel like other companies are trying to play catch up uh, iteratively, and Sentinel-1 is leading the charge, which I'm super proud of. Um, you know, coming on the on the doorstep is things like hyper automation. Uh, you know, we have you know, talked at the beginning on our uh, safe harbor slide around roadmap and things. So uh, we're baking in ever more workflows. Again, Sentinel One several years ago led the charge with XDR, R being response actions. Uh, well, now that's expanding to include full hyper automation. You know, Kyle, I'm sure you know you and me together we see from customers. It's great to have pre built response actions. We want to be able to customize, build our own playbooks. Awesome, we'll have that in the tool for you. But more tactically, one of the issues is, well, it's typically an non-starter just take a platform and just rip it out completely and move to something else. And for anybody who has eagle eyes, if you're watching Kyle's screen, there were a couple of browser tabs that were teed up to the right that have a green logo that looks very familiar. I've spent many times in those. And so Sentinel One has a really nice way to help with the transition. So before we get to transforming, we can actually transition and augment and integrate with existing solutions we can help by ingesting data that typically doesn't make it to other platforms. It's too expensive. It consumes too much licensing. Um, we can help filter and rich that. You can send it to Sentinel One and then you can query it at rest in Sentinel One's platform. Being an API first company, this unlocks some really cool use cases on data where you, data comes to Sentinel One, you can query it directly. So, what does that look like? Well, from a high level, um, that means that Sentinel One has a very robust, you saw the marketplace. Thanks again, Kyle, for that turnkey out of the box integrations ready to go. We do have a deployable agent now, and naturally the EDR agent from Sentinel One captures a ton of telemetry, and we have ever more expanding use cases to capture more and more non-traditional EDR, but you know local log files, and that continues to add more functionality. Now for other ones, there is a very lightweight deployable localized data collection agent that can be used. There's all these different plugins for official software, custom files, whatever that may be. Uh, the tool itself does, as you'd expect in the marketplace, uh, pre-built API calls. And then we also have uh, pre-built integrations with log shippers on the market. So various different companies have done a lot of really cool things with taking data and transforming them and making such that you can connect data relatively easily and do inbound and outbound. You put really out as a sync for those connections. The data comes to our platform. You've already seen the UI UX from Kyle. You can also query it from third party tools by just simply call an API. And then of course, from Sentinel One, we can also push the webhook so we can take maybe alerts or whatever that may be and then push results out to an API. So ways to integrate upstream and downstream with this data lake. You don't have to do just everything in our UI UX because we know that this is built for security practitioners, by security practitioners, so we need to integrate so very tactically, this is a really interesting use case. It's a super unique for our small customers out there. Um, we have a pre-built integration that connects data lakes. Now we've seen the multi-data lake paradigm in the wild. We know that a lot of times, again, it's it's just a non-starter to take something that is a lot of people process technology wrapped together. If we have a fully baked deployment, uh, we're reliant on Splunk and some of the, the you know niche offerings, things like IT service intelligence, could be enterprise security with some custom workflows, things like that. Not a problem. How do we augment this? How do we work with this? Well, that data can come directly to Central One's data lake. We have a TA, it's open source on GitHub. You can go look at it, download it, modify it to your heart's content. By the way, we've had customers that have done some really cool updates for us, which is great. Love that community contribution. You can query the data at rest. That means from your Splunk search heads, there's a TA that runs. You can figure an API URL and token. And now you're able to dispatch queries from Splunk against Sentinel One. Sentinel One queries the data in Sentinel One's data lake, does all of the work that you would know from SPL, things like group and counting, sorting, aggregates, packages that together, delivers it back to Splunk as an event, and you can drive your workflows, drive your dashboards, drive your alerts. And again, that data is queried at rest. That means that you are not having to index the data in Splunk. And that provides a really nice way tie data lakes together to remove some more code over to Sentinel One, where you're going to save costs. You can have more data. And we've had just tremendous response from our customer base on savings of not having to ship all of that data. Um, something like so, 
Iowa again, so I'm going to ask, are you teed up and maybe ready to show some of those browser tabs I saw a moment ago? I am indeed. Thank you, sir. All right. You should be seeing that update account screen. Let me know again if I miss it. But very simply, as Mike referenced, that TA is out there and available. Just to give you an idea how, how easy this is to set up, once you install that TA on our search head, you are just going to take an API key from Sentinel-1, punch it in this box, and hit save, and you are done. Now, how do you actually make use of this? Uh, as Mike said, fundamentally what this is doing is your Splunk search head is making an API call to Sentinel-1. What do you need to do uh, to make that work is you need to tell the Splunk search head what is the query that it needs to pass to Sentinel-1 so we know what data to return. I'm going to give a few simple examples here and I'll run these queries while we're waiting. In order to do this, I use this command pipe dataset. I pass a search string, the search string being the query I would have used in Sentinel-1's UI to retrieve the data I am looking for. So in my case, I just said, hey, you know, go get every data source. I'm going to exclude our meta log just because it wasn't super valuable for this particular use case. And look at that. In a couple of seconds, I've got tons of data. I've got Windows event logs, I've got Palo Alto, I've got Sentinel-1 EDR data, all this stuff that lives in Sentinel-1 showing up, it's available in here. I can create a safe search. I can create an alert. I can build a dashboard off of it as if I was querying a Splunk index, but it never hits the Splunk index. It never hits the cost model for Splunk. It stays inside of Sentinel-1, which is awesome. And this is a very simple example of what you can do with it. You can definitely do much more complicated things. Most of your Splunk organizations out there are going to have much more complicated queries like this, where they currently have a search against an index, followed by SPATH, followed by eval, followed by many other things. In our case, hey, you know what you need to do? Leave 90% of this the same. The raw data is just in a different place instead of being in a Splunk index. So you know what? Go get what you need. In my case, I said, hey, I want every single log that has to do with a laptop in the last 24 hours. Again, I don't know about you, that would probably take a while to return from any Splunk implementation I've worked with, unless the organization has just a ton of money to spend on Splunk. In this case, hey, is there some tiny little latency from making that API call to us? Absolutely, but it is dwarfed by the amount of time that is saved because our query runs so much faster. And we're doing the heavy lifting of searching all the data and pulling it back. And Splunk is just doing the effort of using eval to make some additional field names, doing some stats. They're definitely offering value here between the two of us. It's a much better outcome for our customers. And as, been, as has been commented on before, you reduce your costs, not just improving your performance. One last quick example. Here's a dashboard uh, from the InfoSec app. If I were to actually drill into all these individual dashlets, open it up in search, what you would find is, hey, we've converted this over, and it runs by doing pipe data set and searching against us. Hey, usually a dashboard built on this kind of data, last 24 hours, all these queries, you load it. It's going to take a little bit to load. This is a lot of data. I'm running one, two, three, five, seven, eight, like 20 queries all at the same time against Sentinel-1's API, pulling them all back over the last 24 hours of all of that raw EDR telemetry again, millions of events, and this dashboard renders really quickly. So speed, performance, improvement, cost reduction, all possible just by being able to change one command from search index to search Sentinel-1. That's impressive. That I mean, that endpoints dashboard with those millions and millions of events and all those different panels. That's that's pretty cool. Thank you for that. Well, I'm gonna have to echo that. Thank you so much for that presentation and for the demo. That was so interesting and such a great way. You know, I really love when we get to get into those demos. And I know, uh, you know, it's not easy. And 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 we kind of talked about this a little bit. Mike, you mentioned this when you're uh, in a, in a live demo and kind of going through things in a webinar. You know, you've got a small screen and there's only so much you can cover. But it's so exciting to see something in action like that. So thank you guys very much for that presentation. For as I said, bringing us home in style today. You are 
are you are wrapping up our EcoCast on a fabulous note with lots of great takeaways. Now, for those of you that have been asking questions as we go through, Again, I know that we're not taking a lot of time to stop and pause and dig into Q&A today, but we are making sure that all of the questions get answered. I would say we'd do this on live chat, but I think since we're wrapping up pretty soon in this case, I'm going to tell you that we're going to get back to you over email. So we're going to make sure that those questions uh, get sent on to the Sentinel One team. You will get responses back. So keep those questions coming in. Don't hold on to them. We want to hear from you. And if you're looking for more information right away, click on your screen. We've got some incredible options for you. Data sheets, white papers, case studies, pricing information, whatever it is that you're looking looking for. It's there for you. So make sure you click on the screen there uh, and, and get the information that you're looking for in follow-up. This is the easy button, right? This makes your life easy. You just click on the screen now and then Sentinel One's going to hand you exactly what you need. Speaking of hand you, uh, unintentional segue there, I want you to head on over to the handouts tab. We've got some great resources and takeaways for you. Uh, if you click on the Sentinel One link there, you can access their data sheet, Singularity AI Sim, detect and respond to threats in real time with scalable, automated and blazing fast singularity AI sim. I love that. I love the blazing fast. That's really cool. Uh, and scalable, that's huge, right? These days and, and automation is what really enables that scalability. So all of this is really important. Some great takeaways. It's a quick and easy read. It's two pages long. So it's an easy thing to download, scan over when you're trying to jog your memory later and you're thinking, oh, I know Kyle and Mike told me this and, and I got this information and now I can't remember it. So this is a great way to make sure that you can revisit that information when you need it. So You've got uh, the option to send us some questions. Make sure you're doing that. You've got the option to click on your screen. You've got the option to click on a handout. You have a whole lot of cool stuff in front of you. While you're doing all of that, I am going to give away our final $300 Amazon gift cards of the day. And then I will recap our entire uh, winners list as well. All right, so our final two Amazon gift cards today going to Matthew Chung from California, Matthew Chung from California, and Chantel Prowse from North Carolina, Chantel Prowse from North Carolina. Congratulations to all of our winners. I'm going to read that whole list again. Again, you do need to be here live and present with us at the EcoCast. And our winners today are Chinwei Lin from Washington, Matthew Chung from California, and Chantel Prowse from North Carolina. Congratulations to all of you. We will be in touch once we've wrapped up our our eco cast. But for now, my friends, we are going to have to say goodbye. I can't believe it's already time to end the EcoCast. I feel like I just started chatting with all of you. We were just getting rolling in our day. But you know what? That just means that you'll all have to come back and hang out with me again soon because we've got lots more cool stuff coming your way. And I'm going to tell you about one event in just a moment. I do want to remind you all, though, if you're hanging out on the EcoCast, uh, you know, maybe you've been to a summit, maybe you've been to a megacast and you thought, hey, this would be a lot of fun. I'd like to present here. I have a solution I'd like to share with the community. We would love to hear from you. So shoot us a message at connect at actualtechmedia.com and we will get that conversation rolling. We'll get you out here so you can talk to Mackenzie, you can talk to myself, Keith, Scott. We got a whole awesome crew who are here and just itching to have a chat with you. So make sure you send us a message and let us know if you'd like to join in. All right. Well, with that, on behalf of the Actual Tech Media team, I want to thank our incredible speakers here with us today from Rubric and from Sentinel One for making this EcoCast possible. But as always, my biggest thank you. You guys know this by now. It goes to all of you. I had so much fun chatting with you all today. You know, it was uh, it's it's fall. It's crazy. I saw a few of you chiming in and saying, hey, I haven't been able to come to an EcoCast in a little while because it's been so busy at work. I get that. I think we're all in that phase right now. There's that kind of What's the old proverb about collecting nuts prior to winter? Uh, it was a grasshopper, I think, or a mouse, I forget. But we're all in that phase where we are collecting the nuts, we are getting ready for winter, and it feels absolutely crazy. It is go, 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 go. And at the same time, we know the new year is fast approaching and we're trying to put in that prep time now so that we're ready for 2025 when it hits. There is just a lot on our plates. And while we're in the middle of that, while we're in the thick of that, it is often really hard to pull our head back up and kind of look, look at that strategic approach, look at those bigger picture conversations because we're so deep in the weeds in our day to day. So every single one of you today took time out of the weeds and came and joined us. You are all gathering nuts. That's or, or someone remind me of what that story is. You're all here and you are you are prepping and preparing uh, for those next steps and for that next year. And that is incredible. And I am so happy to be a part of that with all of you. Speaking of which, I do have to put an event on your calendars. If you haven't already signed up for the expert series tomorrow, that's Friday, October 4th on the AI revolution 2024, how AI transforms security and threat detection. Please get this on your calendar. Bill Clayman is speaking. I don't know if you guys have seen one of his keynotes uh, at an EcoCast, Megacast or an expert series before. He's in 
incredible. He is so informative and fun and funny. So you will definitely get something out of this session. Please sign up for that. Again, that's tomorrow, Friday, October 4th at 12 Eastern, 9 a.m. Pacific. Make sure that you come and join us for that expert series on the AI revolution, how AI is transforming security and threat detection. All right. Well, for now, unfortunately, I will have to leave it there and, and say so long, farewell. But I hope that I get to see you all again soon. And until then, I hope you have an absolutely beautiful end to your day. Thanks all.